Um, so, okay, still the round table. So just to give you an um, idea of what's going on. So I actually sent round table questions to them in advance. So there was some time to like, advance prep. I, mean, like, I wanted to do that by the early questions that our speakers. So um, that's what that's what's happening. So I'm just going to sort of go through. I'll go through and then, you know, we, we'll, we can then open. Like naturally open up to a more general Q and A. So like anybody who has a question, like in, in the middle of my talking, you don't have to wait for me to finish everything. Just if you have a question, just like you know, raise your hand, just intervene. It's all right. Um, but I thought I'd start off the roundtable with uh, this question, which actually um, leads on uh, directly from Lee's presentation, which is, um, why do you think the makers and or critics of policy in China, in a broad sense, call upon the Chinese classic in the quotation marks? Um, do you think this relation to the classics is comparable to any other context? And I think you know, he's obviously presented uh, for instance, Europe or is specific to China, like that particular relationship. Oh, it's definitely not specific to China. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, the feature of canon, of use of canons more globally. And somebody who's done some really good work on this is John B. Henderson, back in the 80s. or 90s. But he did this fantastic study of comparative canons. He looked at Talmudic, Quranic, Confucian, Taoist, Buddhist, and maybe a few other canons in there. Um, and he, he noted that there were certain kinds of features that were prevalent in any kind of engagement with the canon. And many of these same features I also find at work in the political theory of canon, which is what I'm expected to teach um, to introductory students, introductory first year students. Um, so it's definitely not unique to China. I think one of the things I was trying to say in my talk is that classic texts have this kind of appeal. They both seem like self-evident repositories of wisdom, even as they're resistant to our interpretation of them. I mean, this is where we, we, we spoke a bit about the, the Han Dynasty, and they had one interpretation of the Mandate of Heaven, and then it gets reinterpreted, and it gets taken up again. This is, this is just much how canons everywhere function. Yeah, I mean, the um, first generation of people who are interacting with the Chinese count from outside are classicists. They've, they've, got, a, uh, they've got the Bible in their heads for a start. Uh, did John Henderson talk about the Christian canon? Talmudic. As such, only Talmudic. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I think he, want, he, was, he was working in Louisiana, so it's probably tactful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, of course, they were classicists in the sense that these... Um, some of the missionaries weren't well educated, but all the consuls would have got a lot of Latin and Greek in their background. And of course, there were, if you look at the uh, uh, Hansard for, for the sort of um, 19th century, there's a lot of quotations from uh, Latin literature in there. And, and there, there were these reference points that everybody was using in, in um, British civilization in the same way that, that more than the five classics, the four books were being used uh, in, in, in Chinese civilization. It, you may be familiar with the earliest <coughs> Chinese grammar that was written by a guy who had studied in France. Um, and he's basically projecting European um, concepts onto Chinese grammar. But it's interesting, I tried reading it. Uh, Every single example he uses, it seemed to me, was from one of the four books. You know, he knew that people had this material in their heads, mm -hmm. so he would naturally refer to it. Um, but in the same way as a biblical quotation in, um, in Victorian Britain would be recognized by absolutely everybody. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's like common reference points being used. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a way of affirming you're an educated person. Yeah? yeah. I have a totally different take. Hurrah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sitting out from the intellectual historical perspective, the point, point one, out one thing, which is classics in the 20th century in China Related to the historical narrative of China itself, who is China? Mm. Who are the Chinese? As, as you know, in 1912, everyone would have like, injected the mm. idea of classics. But then classics reappeared. And as the, the currents I was talking about emerged, new historiographies 
too much. Mm -hmm. The historiography is redefining the character of the Hellenic spots and redefining the nature of classes. We have like the present current, which uh, in the future uh, points points out the, the importance of Neomorism as a key element of Chinese tradition. And then we have neorealist reading of Chinese of classes, which points out Confucianism, the notion of Universes had their own, their own new uh, historiography. The reason for that is that is if you want to reestablish worldview, you need uh, some sort of historical narrative. You need evolutionary narrative. And evolutionary narratives change the notion of tradition. That is the that is mind. The general uh, guess in that. Although that's not the entire story. Because there's also doubting antiquity, yeah. uh, which uh, had its roots already in the 19th yeah. century. Well, well, earlier than that, yeah. there are also yeah. lineages, yeah. which went from, from professors, students, yeah. and yeah. so forth, which preserve some sort of notion of that is. But the connection between world order, identity, and the general narrative evolution of society is key for me. So, so is actually also translation. If you think about it, when so we, is the translation. Now, when think? we change our like, perspective story on China, we change translation. Uh, we we start doubting, the, for example, the connection between Zhuran and nature, which mm -hmm. was self-evident that then, like in a certain kind of time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I was actually quite shocked to see that the translation of nature actually changes in the course of the 20th century. It's funny too because I teach, sometimes I, I, I mean I teach classes that feature Chinese political thought or that Chinese classics, right? And sometimes my students will go and find a translation online, usually it's leg. Yeah. And then I get all sorts of questions about the, what is basically Christian imagery mm. in legs translations of the Chinese classics and they want to know what is this? What is pi? Like they don't know. Yeah, you know, they all of these words that have to do with. I think James um, St. Andre has written about that. It's very. Yeah, this odd. is problematic, and he's he's explored that. Mm -hmm. You know. I'll have to read read that because students come to me with questions, and they have yeah. a very different sense of the text from what I understand because they've read this leg translation, which is infused yeah. with Christian yeah. imagery about heaven and the afterlife and transcendental knowledge and God and all of this stuff. Piety, faith. So, is there a classic given translation? <laughs> well, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Julia, if you don't mind. Um, so, I'm, I'm listening to I looked at the first part of the, well, the first part of the symposium. You were describing how these German thinkers were making use of Taoism. I was just sitting there thinking, like, this is so wacky. This doesn't sound like anything I've read about Taoism. And not being somebody who's completely, um, you know, speed on 1920s, like German philosophy, I was thinking, is this just cultural appropriation? Like, is it just a form of Orientalism where they're seeing themselves in whatever they take to be Taoism? It's just like a mirror through which they can view their own civilization? Or are they constructing something new? And does it matter if it has absolutely no connection to Taoism, whatever that is? That's a really great question, a really good point, because it's also methodological, something that you know, I clearly have to deal with in this project. Um, I don't think it is reducible to Orientalism, even though the transmission of ideas clearly participated in Orientalism mm -hmm. via the type who was trans uh, translating, who were the intermediaries, etc. As I was, you know, I sort of uh, gave it outlined. Um, and the reason is that there's a big difference between um, what an Orientalist object is versus the kind of object that somehow retains traces of its contemporaneity, whether it be awareness in some legible way of the contemporary political, social embeddedness of that object from which it, of that object came. And I, let's just say briefly, <laughs> there's full, I, I have philological evidence for that much, and it's very specific. And I, I you know, at least like the way I've justified it is um, by comparison with the vast amounts of Lao Tzu reception in Germany at that time, Viso 
my specific focus is quite a select group, actually. I selected them specifically because they have such a peculiar way of understanding the Tao, as opposed to more broadly this like Tao enthusiasm that was consuming most of Germany, actually. Um, probably for colonial reasons. It's just like in Britain. I mean, Germany was the other place where like a proliferation of translations of uh, like Taoist texts and also Confucianist texts were happening, I think. Um, you're, you're, well, please correct well, but, me. <laughs> but, maybe, but maybe there's something different between Germany and Britain in, in that the way that, that people like Wilhelm uh, mm -hmm. and, and even earlier Buber and so forth mm -hmm. are interacting with collaborators on a much more equal footing than, say, like using one power as a kind of sidekick, you, you know. No, but Buber was using him as a sidekick. The, the guy wants that he's, he's like mis the name is mistranscribed. It took like there's one other scholar who has managed to actually find the, his real name because then also some people writing about Wuba. Yeah, but Wilhelm. Wilhelm, yeah, Wilhelm's different, obviously, but um, Wilhelm also Christian. I mean, he he does Goethe Goetheanize right. Goetheanize <laughs> his version of the Tao Te Ching basically because of his cultural project. He's he believes in intercultural dialogue, which is kind of like. <laughs> Not, but the point I think is, you know, what they all made of it in such a way that the um, historical transformability of an interpretation is detained, right? In, in some essence, rather than as an orientalist object, which, if you imagine, is what, essentially like an object behind glass in a museum, stable, inert, uh, an artifactual thing that's appreciated mainly for its aesthetics, minus any sort of like I sense that there's some sort of social, historical, or political ramification associated with that object. Um, so in the in terms of the wackiness of it, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, suppose the standard of judging whether something is Taoist or not. No, there is no standard. Is that, no, not precisely. Yeah. It's, it's exactly like uh, what you're saying. Yeah, like, it's there's like, no, just like you don't want to adjudicate between, you know, you know, um, uh, one version of the mandate heaven versus another one, mm -hmm. right? Whether one is more correct than another. Similarly, the adjudication of like whether in, you know any Western reception of an idea from a Taoist classic was necessarily Orientalist can proceed without running into the same problem of having to adjudicate between a more authentic version versus a less authentic version of the text. I think it really is, has so to do with cultural appropriation. <coughs> never happen. No, no, that's not true. <laughs> there, there's two, there's some ramifications of it. There's there's one thing, but the the, the, the I'm sorry, I'm talking about myself so much. <laughs> this is meant to be about you guys. But um, the leader of the youth movement, I would say, was instrumental in disseminating the Tao Te Ching in the German context. Gustav Wittekin. He probably is like. Ground zero in, in the sense of like how all these people, Buba, Benjamin, Kafka, uh, Kafka, etc., Dick Fulda also first got enthused um, with the Tao Te Ching. Um, but uh, there's a conversation that a friend of Kafka's recorded uh, of Kafka sort of bitching about this guy, basically saying this guy basically commits the error of thinking that the, mistaking the Tao Te Ching as a record of reality. Mm. And that is that then turns into just like a document of how to li live one's life, and that is, I think, the Orientalist version mm -hmm. of what this is. See, I was thinking, if, so I've done a lot. I mean, in my former life, I, I wrote a lot about the 1920s, 30s in China, where there was a lot of this kind of stuff going on because they were borrowing, like Western texts, right? Mm -hmm. And what was said about many of those Chinese thinkers was. They've misunderstood. They've appropriated. They are um, they're combining things that shouldn't be combined. They're contradictory. They're misguided, right? It's only when Germans do it to Chinese then it has a special. Then then we can have this kind of conversation about uh, the contemporaneity that doesn't exoticize the Oriental object. Like, why can't we just say, like, do you see what I mean? Like, I I buy it. Like, I buy it. And so part of my work using Chinese sources has been to say, no, they were doing real thought with real thinking. It was real thinking. It had substantive contributions to theoretical discussions of whatever nature, right? Oh, yeah. But I got a lot of pushback from that because people say, no, 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 they, they, they don't understand these texts. They don't understand Russell. They don't understand 
I suppose it's about, it's about, it's, you know, it's really about the, you know, the, 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 the premise that you, 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 you impute onto, like, you know, judging, I, I don't know, I, I'm a literary scholar by training, but I can't, like, under the words objectivity, have a hard time putting it in terms of, like, text, right? What I want to say is, I mean, I want to be more specific on this. I'm specifically, I didn't mention this because it's, I thought it was, like, a little bit, really wacko in terms of like today's context, but um, I'm looking specifically at German Jewish authors. And I think it matters a lot in terms of the theologization or non-theologization of the Taoist text in comparison to, as I said, the broader context of like the German enthusiasm for Taoists, in, including especially, you know, non-Jews, I mean the majority, you know, German majority, and also eventually um, Nazi appropriation of the same Heidegger, I mean, the most famous like, German philosopher besides Buba, whose reception of Taoism is greatly studied this day, these days, is Heidegger. It's sanitized, first of all, because you know people just, most philosophers simply want to compare <laughs> without thinking about the, his, like, the historiography of it, the historical context, also like the philosophy of history that's contained in the use of sources. So with regard to Heidegger, he's, you know, contextualized with the phenomenology and then compared to Martin Buba mostly. Uh, big problem with this because what's the big upshot of Heidegger's um, use of Taoism? Well, Gelassenheit, which is kind of like Wu Wei, like kind of like non-action. But he comes up with it like, you know, 1945, 1946, after Germany's lost the war, after he's trying to think of a new horizon for like Germany's destiny. Oh, it's, and guess what? It's China. <laughs> like, there's a big, you know, and I think it's similar to what this friend of Kafka said about Kafka being critical about Gustav Winnikin's take on Taoism. Um, people, like, there's kind of Western reception that might want to take the Tao Te Ching as a document of reality, as though it were an alternate reality that may be held off in aesthetic terms and therefore one towards which we might aspire to solve the ills of Western civilization, which of course in the 1920s is much been glaring here. Everything's in decline. You know, we want to look for the next alternative. So, you know, but these people that, I th there's a possibility of like, like interacting with classics, so to speak, or like these texts in a way that like, um, doesn't just like have German Jews reflect on their own alterity, but actually, you know, interrogate uh, conceptions of history, um, conce like philosophical conceptions of history, that renegotiate the whole, the very idea of a what action looks like, non-productive, etc. That, that's sort of like the bigger context of this, and like there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Like where I'm really talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Has to do with like recognitions of like you know whether a peasant revolution is possible without undergoing the requisite stage of industrialization, and that's like Roth and Wittfogel. There's Basically, the, I'm going to stop <laughs> talking, <laughs> but that's, I think, I think there is a, you know, there's a differentiation between, like, you know, different kinds of Western uses, and, like, it can, you know. But I do want to, by the way, so I want to transition, get back to you guys, but basically, like, you know, I just have to stand up because I have a back problem. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, it's not, doesn't mean anything. I'm not trying. I'm not trying. I'm not trying. So in the course of, the research that you've heard way too much about just now, but um, you know, one question that actually insinuates itself over and over again is whether Taoism is a religion or a philosophy. Um, that's a Western question. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good. That's a good way to answer. That's a very good. Uh, that's a very good um, it, answer to your question. If you want the historical answer, mm. um, the terms mean nothing in early China. Um, the there is a bit of foul play going on by the. 5th century and 6th century, where it's in the interest of Buddhists to say, um, yeah, phonies, really. Um, you know, that Lao Tzu, he was okay. He's part of the Chinese tradition, and uh, they will accept maybe, yeah, that all, all that health stuff, it's good for you. You should eat right and keep fit. Yeah, we will agree with that. But, but, um, but then they will denounce um, more recent revelations in Taoism. Um, so, the, the, the philosophy thing is to some extent a reflection of uh, the Buddhist need to validate non 
the non-Buddhist tradition in China rather selective. Okay? Um, you will be told by people who should know better that there is a distinction between Tao Jia and Tao Jia, between the school of the Tao and the teaching of the Tao, the one being mm -hmm. philosophical and the other religious. It doesn't stand up to inspection. If you, if you look at, um, say, uh, 12th century sources, uh, I'm looking at Zhu Xi, for example, and he says, yeah, Tao is not up to much these days, but there again, neither are Confucian, so whatever. Um, but in, in discussing this, he uses either term um, without yeah. distinction. Um, it, it, I'm not sure when this, uh, obviously, if you have no concept of philosophy or religion, uh, you're not going to use a, 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 a distinctive terminology very much. So again, I'm thinking maybe Meiji, uh, Japan, I'm not sure, I haven't looked at it, but, but certainly it's, it's a kind of orientalist imposition on a situation in China that simply doesn't reflect those kinds of traditions. Maybe I, Iran I, is associated with Protestant Christianity yeah, and missionary. Yeah. And other oh, I'm not denying that the, 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 <coughs> the different aspects. I mean, there is no Taoism in early China. Nobody talks about Taoism in any sense. Maybe it's a it's a bibliographic category during the Han. Yeah. Uh, so, but 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 that's kind of librarians. They have so much to answer for. Um, but but still, you, you know, you could you, the the way Tao is used is 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 um, for a long time until there's a until Buddhists actually enter the scene and want to differentiate things. Tao is used extremely usefully to talk about. Well, the Buddhists use it themselves. We are the Tao Ren. We are the men of Tao. Um, or you, you, yeah, yeah, um, or uh, the Confucian classics are are Tao, the teachings of Tao, Tao Jiao. You know that's Confucianism, and so it's it's all over the place. But once you start to get um, into religious polemic, then then things do shift. And of course, into religious polemic is, is a lot to do with patronage. You know, if some other guy is going to get more money than you do, and more monasteries founded. You're, you're going you, you, you know, to take steps against that, um, but otherwise, um, you know, my 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 sense from um, you know Lake Han or whatever, I, I, I don't see any Taoism as such. So there are groups, yes, yes. and they are organised. But what are they organised on? Very interesting. But to my mind, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me on this. They are imperial groups, but their empire is the empire of the unseen world, because both worlds are bureaucracies. When, as you say, things collapse, and the bureaucracy in the real world can't cope anymore, there are priests who will tell you, yeah, we know some bureaucrats, but you can't see them, <laughs> uh, but we'll pray to them for you, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I would kind of agree, and, and that kind of movements end up, ended up leading yeah. to the introduction of Buddhism as well. Yeah. Because they were always tr looking for some new authority, yeah. new ways of managing the society. Yeah. Yeah. Do either of you want to add to this? There's a question in the back. Um, yes, yeah, so it's just, uh, just on that point of division that you suggest might be Orientalist, that uh, philosophy on the one hand or religion on the other is a description yeah. of Tao. I mean, can we really say that so easily? Because uh, in a kind of modern setting, the description of religion is separated from philosophy generally, and that wouldn't necessarily be Orientalist, but of course all religious traditions, that distinction wouldn't be observed. So could we really easily say that it's a, it's a kind of Orientalist position to kind of make it into a binary? I'm not sure, but I, sus I have my suspicions. Uh, I mean, part of it, because I've seen so much of this rhetoric um, about uh, the nature of the Taoist tradition in late imperial China. As I say, the missionaries seem to have it in for them from the start, and I wonder if it's to do with the celibate, uh, non celibate priesthood. The, um, the rhetoric of. So you mean that they needed 
they needed their religious folk to be Puritans, and that yeah, was their yeah, problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, next, they, they they pretended to be Buddhists, but then they found that Buddhists weren't that um, well regarded either in, in late Ming China. So they said, "Oh, Confucius, he's the guy." But you know, we think Confucius actually a really good guy. He needed a bit of revelation just to um, be an even better guy. Um, but he probably had some good ideas about heaven, but um, but um, not not very clear ones, unfortunately. Um, so you'll need a bit of um, good Catholic doctrine on that one. But um, so they they are manoeuvring within in quite a complex situation, and, and the Taoists are getting it in the neck. Then there is the there is the lack of patronage under the Manchu, um, which is quite a shift. But I think there are other things going on as well. Um, one problem is that um, a lot of Taoism is invisible to the external observer in the sense that, yes, you can see Taoist rituals and, and uh, you know, they're fairly conspicuous in local society uh, at, you know, at Uh, uh but, but the, that ritual function is only one aspect of what Taoism, uh, if, if, if you know, the Taoist tradition does, and it's a very broad and flexible tradition. There is, of course, um, an aspect of Taoism which is uh, domestic, made down. It's a kind of yoga that you don't practice um, publicly and collectively. There's also a problem in that. The, the reading of the Tao Te Ching has at least a couple of levels to it um, in the, this sense, and I will concede this to the mystics. mystics. Um, I did have a Taoist priest in a class of mine. Um, well, he was, a, he was doing a PhD, but I said, come along to the, the Taoism class, and, and so I was talking about you know, the various commentaries on the Tao Te Ching. Very interesting evolution of commentary, which to a historian is extremely interesting. And at the end of, at the, end of the class, I said, right, but however, here is a guy who actually knows what it means, and pointing to him. And he said, I couldn't. You'd have to be an initiate. Mm. Uh, and, he's, and I said, oh, well, I'm very sorry, folks, to the class. And he said, but what you've told them won't do them any harm. <laughs> so, yeah. so just, just on that missionary critique, um, wouldn't the three treasures be a form of revelation of a kind, of a sort? Three what? The three treasures. The samba, yes. Um, I, you have to look at the way that people wrote about South Asia. Um, because there's very little missionary writing about Chinese Buddhism. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, and they have a, they have a get out in, in, in Chinese Buddhism. They say, and, and this goes back actually, actually to Catholic missions in origin, but, but, but it comes in quite strongly in the 19th century, and the get out is this. Yeah, these Buddhists, they, they, um, they look a bit like... Uh, Romish priests, in a way, they got their rituals and their celibacy and all that. Romish, being the Protestant view of this, um, and, and some of them were maybe good guys, but they borrowed all this from Nestorian Christianity in the Middle Ages, which is historically totally indefensible. But it was an argument that allowed them to recognise um, some validity in some Buddhists. It didn't last very long because um, uh, eventually people got better informed, but from from at least, it's coming in in the 1870s, especially after the dis discovery of the uh, Nestorian inscription in, in, in Xi'an, uh, and it lasts, it's, it's even in Wilhelm a bit, uh, where, where, you know, he uh, he, he makes some nice remarks about um, Taoist alchemy and says, well, of course, probably a bit of Nestorianism in there or something, mm. you know. Uh, and it's by now completely vanished, but that was the argument at that time. So, I guess jumping off of that, like maybe this takes us in a different direction, but my third question actually <laughs> has to do with what I perceived maybe as a um, productive tension 
between the sonification of universal experience versus the universalization of Chinese difference, if there is one. Yes. Did you say that the sonification of universal experience versus the universalization of Chinese difference? Yes. So it seems like that as the 1920s progressed, a problem emerged of how to think concepts of virtue, activity, or public good, for instance, together with or maybe against Chinese tradition, which occurred also alongside modernization, so like you know, collision of imperialism and colonialism with Chinese as a country. And then in the 2020s, the situation may seem to be the reverse, so one in which difference seems to be ascribed a scriptural significance, perhaps, to promote the ascendancy of the new universal. Uh, in your view, how accurate or adequate is this brief history of the idea of the universal? Um, is it necessary to complicate this picture? If so, how, why? I would complicate it by, by, by saying I, I don't want to go into all the aspects of this because other people could do this better. But I get the impression seen it all before in this sense, that Meiji Japan is also an, a, a, a situation where the East Asian tradition and, and, and obviously uh, Japanese education absorbed a very great deal of the Chinese classics and everything into it, um, including the language, um, went through very rapid changes. And yes, there is, uh, I, I, I had to check for um, um, some of the teachers of this period, what I, I call Michel Moore, on Unitarianism in Japan. And he situates that, along with a lot of other research about Japan, into a search for you know, values that could, uh, could cope with this new situation. Uh, universal values, perhaps. And, and that's where Unitarianism came in, amongst other things. Um, that's where Zen uh, emerges as a rival to Christianity, blah, 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 blah. So uh, I, would see, I would say yes. Um, I would not be surprised on the basis of what I know about Meiji Japan if there was a seeking for universal values. As to now, all I can tell you is this. There was going to be... Uh, uh, there was a lot of talk in the 1980s about an emerging Japanese superstate. It sort of went down the tubes. Um, uh, but people haven't noticed, I think, an interesting aspect of this. If suppose you're Japanese and you truly believe that you're going to be, uh, you know, heading out towards a superstate and everybody's going to be looking to you. Uh, Japanese, certainly in the 1970s, were spending a lot of time saying how unique they were to the point that, you know, God gave the Japanese a thumb that is especially adapted to pinball machines and, and other useful ideas like this. Um, but, but when they suddenly realize that they, there is a prospect that they may actually be, you know, the beacon of humanity, you, you can't really sell your excellence with a with pinball thumb to the world as something to look up to. Um, you've got to come up with something better. And then you've got a very interesting is to do, you know, with uh, what was happening in China, um, and the commercialization of tourism. There was a Silk Road boom, uh, part of which was to do with the fact that people could now go and look at the Silk Road. Um, There's a Silk Road boom now, copy your app. Absolutely. But, but you see, what happened then was you can read the Silk Road boom as being a way of affirming Japanese material culture as the end product of a transnational process, that Nara is the culmination of civilization because it was the end terminus for the Silk Road, that Japan has received the whole of Asian and European civilization. So it is on that basis that we're going to be the ones who can guide you from the emerging Japanese superstate. It didn't last long enough for anybody to write about it much, but um, I think it has lessons for today. No, I think it's still a technological one. Right? Yeah. It's still, we are the Chugoku. Yeah. The Dongo, yeah. Which is actually a reused Japanese technology for their purpose. Yes. There's a whole region. Yes, yes. I will speak about something else now. Um, for me, the problem is translation. Yeah. 
Now we have inflation of translation <laughs> in, in Köln. Inflation of translation? Of translation. Oh. <laughs> and translation in our case means what? Glossing. Primarily glossing. You find the proper uh, term for one one notion in Chinese mm -hmm. and, and in the Western language. Mm -hmm. But is this really the whole task of translation? No. Ah. Implication. Yeah. <laughs> Context, implication, stuff like that. And the same thing, the same problem is being applied to the 1920s and 30s when we think about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. So um, universalism, maybe uh, notional universalism, maybe it's, it, it, it appears to us that now the Chinese subjectivity is universalized in a way. But as we know, the main thing in experience is much more than just notions and narrative. But the common scale shared shared within a cultural domain. Uh, so I'll be skeptical about about the notion of universal here. But there is another important thing related to the universal. It is a key part of change, intellectual change. A key part of narrative is the notion of universal versus particular, which drives intellectual change for the last of 200 years. Yeah. Uh, and in this sense, uh, universalism within narratives, political narratives, social narratives, should be observed not as an objective fact, but as means of translating and retranslating, uh, of re-establishing identities within a new order. This complicates things a lot, but uh, what I want to say is that um, cultural appropriation sh is, is something which obscures uh, what we should be looking at. And this is the natural preponderance of, intro um, of introducing concepts from one context to another. A natural preponderance towards analytical uh, reasoning about their meaning. Analytical, uh, analogical, which means in, in concrete terms. If we imagine that we are in 1920s in China, there is the basis, intellectual basis, the tradition and the recent experience, and a few pieces of knowledge from the West. Do we really expect that, that when, for example, notions like science entering into this discourse, do we expect that they would be? just moved from one context to another and then restructured there. But we seem to think so because there was a notion of science which emerged in China which described our time. So translation of scars as well as helps in this sense. I just have a, I don't think I'm answering Julia's question so much as I'm responding yeah. or kind of chiming in with what's already been said. But. I was thinking about the fact that, so um, I recently won a big grant from the British Academy and I'm leading a team of 22 people from the theme of Chinese global orders. And the point behind this grant, the reason we wrote the grant and we wanted to get this grant was, we saw China as being a norm giver, not just a norm taker in the international arena. And this was a, we thought this was a very exciting opportunity to figure out what was the norms it was giving, like what was the role being played by China in the global order. So what we've discovered is actually there is no single unified vision and China looks different depending on where you look at it. If you're looking at it from the whole of Pakistan or you're looking at it from the perspective of religious uh, movements along the, the new Silk Road, the BRI, or if you're looking at it from Johannesburg, South Africa, using thinking about patterns of Chinese migration, it just looks, there is no, <laughs> we're now thinking maybe there is no unified subject to China that we're even capable of studying, which is not a direct answer to your question. I th actually, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're kind of like, well, we're going to just roll with this now. I mean, um, <laughs> well, I think, no, I think that's, I, I think that, yeah, don't tell the British you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think I think that's 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 really that's really key. And well, I mean, this is not a question that we can probably answer right now. But like, you know, in, in what sense then, like, the ch like Chinese universalism is a complete departure from universalism as the way I'm even uttering it right now. You know, is it what? 
Yeah, anyway, that's it's probably not something we can well, why do we have to call it universal? I mean, it might be or something that, or that. different and yeah. might be something. Yeah. I mean, so one just, of the things... That's one of the translations of Tunsia, I think, right? But I think. No? One of them? The Vian is universalism, like in the <clears throat> philosophical yeah. sense. I mean, yeah, I... I'm looking at translation. Yeah, anyway. But like, one of the things I was going to say, I mean, this is in response to the Tunsia's um, ideas like religion and philosophy, they didn't conceptually exist late 19th, early 20th century in China. I mean, like, the reification, these concepts didn't exist, so, but that didn't mean people weren't thinking and analyzing the world in really rigorous and sophisticated ways. So then maybe part of what we should be doing is thinking about how they were doing that. Right, in the causes of modernization also, like, it, it coincides, I think, with, mo like, mo movements in modernization, like, the inventions of these terms and feels are this distinct or whatever, it coincides also with whatever, the, you know, present modernization. Um, I'm aware we're really out of time, but um, one very, very final question then. Uh, how crucial is the term critical misunderstanding is for each of you? Critical misunderstanding. This is coming, you know, inspired by Jan's talk and like critical misunderstanding. What do you, I mean, do you think this is useful, not useful for from your specific disciplinary background? Well, I'm all about hermeneutic naivety when it comes to interpreting differences between theories. Uh, but I tend, tend to think now that uh, the key misunderstanding is actually the belief in hermeneutic unity. Belief in hermeneutic unity. Yeah. And this is uh, the the lesson we actually get from uh, comparative intercultural interrogation. When we take a look back how texts migrated, how texts changed the time, how they were differently interpreted, we learn that lesson. Um, but the problem with misunderstanding at another level, at a political, social level, is that in our world orders, we don't tend to allow uh, ambiguities. Mm -hmm. And there, misunderstandings and understandings have clear political implications, social implications. We, and we regard them as part of our social identity. An identity of movement, an identity of a nation, and in this regard, theoretical criticism, intellectual physiography, should pay attention to, to this kind of uh, misunderstanding and try to translate them into the political discourse, which is actually the pragmatic use of physiography of modern China, which we should hope. Because that's intervention, I think. And it is both scholarly intervention as well as contemporary translation of what we do as knowledges into reality. And uh, the problem here is that we think that we should adopt some sort of notion of truth. We shouldn't. Uh, it is as pragmatic as, as the, the use of universities in politics. So, our engagement with politics. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the first I've heard the term, though. I would say, unfortunately, the word misunderstanding is too often used to describe what non-Western people do in regard to Western materials and um, inspiration or innovation is more often used when Westerners appropriate non-Western resources. So I, I, I don't like this term misunderstanding. I've seen it used too many times um, to describe what a lot of the Chinese thinkers I study and write about don't. I don't Understanding different. Well, history of religion, you know, it's the driving force. You, you, you know, um, look at the Reformation. You can say it's about the mistranslation of a single word, distance, faith. You know, um, and in fact, there is a big movement in Protestant um, uh, historiography now to go back and say, oh, maybe we got the hey, stop. Uh, maybe Luther got it all wrong. Maybe it's a mistranslation. You know. If you can do that with a with a major shift in Europe, or to be a bit careful with what you're doing with China, you know, it's the only lesson I can learn from that. Well, with that said, <laughs> thank you everybody for being. Thank you all of you for being agreeing to be a part of indulging me. Uh, thank you all of you for coming. Um, and um, 
Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, as I said, this was the first of three. The next two are here. Um, the event brights are not ready for that yet, but if you want to receive the information about it in whatever way, you can scan that QR code <laughs> on the left, which will get you to the um, mailing list of the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought at Goldsmiths, which is what I co-direct there. So if you sign on to the mailing list there, you'll receive information about those two things. The next one is also, the next one is going to be quite a bit of a departure from today. <laughs> um, I'll actually be giving an actual paper there as well, talking about Kafka. Uh, it's on Chinese modernity and German Jewish thought, so I'll actually be going into an answer to your question <laughs> earlier. Um, and it's also taking place in this room. And the third event is going to be in July, and that's way broader. Um, Futures of Critique in a Pluricentric World. Um, I'll also be giving a paper there, mostly on Wittfogel and multilinearity and uh, the question of geographical determinism. And uh, alongside um, all these uh, amazing other thinkers from around the world, actually, South Africa, Mexico, uh, Lebanon, uh, Hong Kong, and, uh, and a few more places. So um, if you're interested, I hope you uh, can come. Um, and thank you once again. Thank you.